We had to go to plan B, which was to go south to London, find another engraver. Fortunately, with the notoriety he had gained already, he didn't have terribly much because he found uh, Robert Havel, who was the preeminent engraver in London. Uh, Havel, uh, I think like um, Lazar's, was enthusiastic with, about the project, uh, and I think he must have been because he stuck with Audubon for the next 11 years that it took to complete the project. Uh, during this time, this 11 years, uh, from 1827 to 1838, uh, Lazar's and, or I'm sorry, Havel and uh, Audubon produced a total of 435 plates. Well, obviously some of them had done, been done previously uh, by Lazar's, but by the time it was all done, 435 plates. Audubon's original plan had been that there would be 400, but I think he discovered there were more birds than he planned on. Uh, so during this time, uh, obviously, uh, Havel and his staff are working, uh, engraving these copper plates, coloring them. Um, Audubon is all over the place. He's trying to enlist subscribers. His plan was to get about 300 subscribers, and he did fairly well. He got between 250 and 300 subscribers, which allowed for the project to more or less break even. It did not make him a wealthy man. Uh, he made, I believe, six or eight transatlantic crossings during this period going back to the United States, traversing all through the wilds of America uh, to draw these birds. Uh, ironically, he killed a lot of birds in the process. He would shoot them, pose them, uh, and get some amazing drawings. Uh, some he would sketch from life, but uh, he was very busy. Needless to say, his family did not see much of him uh, during this period. I think his wife became um, used to that, I, although they did have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a, a devoted marriage, but I think she was extremely understanding, although she had to go to work uh, to support the family. She had to work as a governess uh, during portions of this time, which at that time was unusual for a married woman to do. So uh, it was, as I said earlier, a massive undertaking. Finally, the project is completed in 1838, and at that time, uh, the subscribers, uh, who, uh, I'll backtrack just a moment, they would have received uh, periodically about five plates at a time. Uh, they would have received one of these large plates, and you saw the, I'll backtrack one, um, the eagle right there, the American bald eagle. Uh, they would have received one of these large, what I call almost showstopper plates. Then they would have received maybe one to two medium-sized birds, and then perhaps two to three small birds. Uh, so you would have a range through that, and that's how the project proceeded until its completion. Uh, Audubon's thought was to have them gathered into four volumes of 100 plates each. Obviously, volume four has 135, because there were more birds uh, in plates. But when the project was completed, the subscribers could then choose to have their plates bound into volumes such as this. This is actually uh, volume one of the North Carolina set. And, or they could remain loose, and some collections still are loose. There probably are around 185, um, just under 200 known intact sets left, um, I think not just in the United States, but known worldwide. So of the original production number, that's a pretty good amount. Obviously some were broken up, some were damaged and lost. But that's really quite remarkable. Um, at the time, a full subscription was $1,000. And so in 1826, 1830, 1838, that was a lot of money. I mean, for me, it's still a lot of money. But, um, but that was a very large sum at that time. And uh, now it's increased probably from 1000 to close to $10 million for a complete set. So uh, they have uh, appreciated quite a bit in value. Now, as you can see here, uh, volume one of the North Carolina set, and on volume one, that is actually not the original binding. It was rebound in the early 1900s. Uh, the other three volumes have their original bindings from the mid-19th century. But North Carolina actually uh, got theirs uh, on a discount. They paid only $600 for theirs. They got it secondhand uh, in 1846. Uh, the reason they got it discounted was it was missing two plates. 
uh, pretty good deal. Not a, not a bad investment. Uh, but at the time, it was very celebrated, and, and the uh, governor had been urged to, to purchase a set for the state, and that did happen. The books went into the North Carolina State um, Library in Raleigh, where they were accessible to the public for about 120 some years, about 128 years, from 1846 until 1974. And at that time, uh, fortunately, the decision was made with the behest of certain people who uh, are in our audience today, person, uh, being involved, they were transferred, accessioned by the North Carolina Museum of Art, which um, it, was uh, developing into uh, a very prominent institution, and certainly is now. The Museum of Art in 1974. Uh, three years later, uh, a benefactor, I think Mr. Gordon Haynes from Winston-Salem, uh, located and purchased uh, replacements for the two missing prints. Uh, so he bought from a loose set. Uh, so the North Carolina finally, by 1977, had a full, complete set. Uh, unfortunately, though, this was a set that was not on exhibit at, anymore, and they had been, uh, shall we say, lovingly handled by the public uh, for that 128 years. And when we get into the treatment portion, which I will very shortly, I'll describe some of that loving uh, that the books received. Unfortunately, though, they were in a safe environment, and they sat in storage uh, until about four years ago, when finally in the early 2000s, uh, the North Carolina Museum of Art uh, and uh, several other uh, benefactors through museum developed a, an adopt a bird program uh, so patrons could actually adopt a plate, uh, thereby donating funds for the conservation. It was, the effort was actually very successful. Funds were raised uh, to treat volume one and actually, once we got volume one treated, uh, the funds were really came in very rapidly for volumes two, three, and four for the project to be completed. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. So you can see volume one here. Obviously, it has um, some issues. It's very worn. And let's see, we'll go there. And the plates are very damaged. Um, I'll get the point of um, areas of interest. Uh, you can see here a uh, large uh, crease here as the pages got folded over. And of course, keep in mind, these pages are large. They are about 38 and a half inches by about 25 inches. Uh, it's actually what we call a double elephant folio. Uh, so it is uh, very large. And especially in the outer ones, they tend to, if you don't handle them properly, they tend to get folded and creased over. And as I said, this is actually not terribly far from life sense. But you can see it's cracked, it's damaged. And um, on the back side, um, you can see the, the turkey hen and the chicks here running around. You can see this large crack here. I, it was very expertly repaired with some brown <laughs> craft paper and some rubber cement. Um, so that. Um, but I guess it kept it together. Uh, in, an even larger piece of craft paper on this, uh, and if you can look, at, it's a little difficult to see, but you can see these little wrinkles across here. The paper is puckered, uh, what we call cockling, all along that repair. Let's see, I'll, I'll leave it on there for just a sec. That's just some of the damage, some of the love, maybe, I should rephrase. Um, we also found coffee stains, uh, other unidentified stains, cigar ash, cigarette ash, cigar burns, ink stains, fly specks, uh, pencil marks, some crayon, uh, some, I think, uh, some small doodles from school children who, who got to view these. Um, so, and of course you can see, if you look also, uh, these are smudges, these are fingerprints. Of course, keep in mind, uh, for much of the life of these things, uh, what kind of heat did you have? You had coal and wood heat in these places. There was soot, there was kerosene, uh, coal dust. All of that gets transferred in there. Uh, probably, I think there were even some tobacco stains, you know, that went back to the tomb used to be in all public buildings. So, Folios, it's amazing they survived as intact as they did, but obviously they had a lot of problems. 
uh, the damage you saw to the more recent binding from volume one uh, was fairly typical to the other volumes too. They were bound in a similar m style and they too uh, were quite worn and abraded from lots of use. But fortunately since they were bound, I think that did offer some protection to the plants. So finally, as I brought us up to around 2002 and then beginning in 2003, we started treatment of uh, volume one. And I will go to that. That is my uh, former colleague Daniel Strohmeyer there. He is disbinding that volume and uh, I think Daniel disbound volume one but I have actually been involved in the, the disbinding and rebinding process for the other three volumes. Um, what we initially do when the, when the book comes in is to take a series of uh, documentary photographs. You saw the one of the binding. You probably saw a small project number and some other things in the lower part of the photograph. Uh, we document what the binding it looks like before we even touch it and then we take pictures through the process just as we've done here uh, with this binding. And you can see if you look up here uh, where the original sewing was, a lot of adhesive uh, and pulling it apart. And just to take the book apart, take probably uh, four to six hours just to take the pages apart. It's uh, a fairly laborious process. Uh, once the book is apart, we actually go through and take an individual shot front and back of each plate. And that gives us a pre-treatment baseline so that we can see exactly the state of the damage and also have a record before we've even touched it of um, what things look like. Once that happens and everything is accounted for and cataloged, uh, we start surface cleaning to remove the grime. And in this case, uh, we're using a couple different things, uh, picking up some loose grime here with a dry latex sponge. And in this case, we're using ground up um, plastic eraser from the Mar Statler or Magic Rub Eraser. And you just rub that over the image. And the colors are very stable. We had no flaking of the image. But we do check that very carefully to be sure that none of the pigment that's been applied would come up. So we're surface cleaning, uh, getting all of uh, all the grime off as much as possible. In some cases, the paper is quite stained, and we can't um, we can't do anything for that. And I will tell you, some of you may not be aware, we can actually wash documents. We can put them in water and float out stains, oftentimes. But because these were colored with watercolor, uh, we can't really do that. Um, the color can it does tend to stabilize a little bit over time, but not every color does, and it's a very risky process to full-scale washing. So we primarily limited uh, our cleaning to the dry type cleaning that you saw here. Here's my colleague Grace White and I will say at this point uh, we have two different departments at Etherington Conservation. We have the book lab and the paper lab and all of the actual treatment of the plates is handled by the paper lab. The binding part is the book lab, uh, primarily in that case. And so uh, we'll see a little bit of, of that later. But uh, Grace is, uh, she's surface cleaned, she has surface cleaned, and now she's actually repairing uh, tears to the edges. She has a small tacking iron she's just using right here at the very edge of the document to, to dry and mend. And then just being, uh, it's a thin, strong Japanese paper um, that is toned more or less to the color of the original paper, and it's applied with a wheat starch paste, which we ever needed to take the repair off would come off very easily, unlike the attractive uh, craft paper and rubber cement repairs that had been previously used. Uh, at this point, uh, some plates were very badly lined. This is uh, uh, Director of Conservation Michael Lee and, again, Grace White. Uh, and they are actually flattening and getting ready to line uh, a print. We the first one I showed you that has the large creases and tears down the side. You can't just uh, apply a strip of Japanese paper and hope that that one will, will be good to go. Uh, we actually have to back the entire sheet with a thin sheet of Japanese paper and um, so that it has support all the way across and it will flex like it should when it's back in book form. So that's a fairly involved process there and here's just a few shots of that. Uh, other plates, um, as I mentioned, we did have fly specks and other uh, small stains. And here's one of my colleagues, I believe this might be uh, Tahiza Law, actually uh, using uh, a small brush to uh, apply 
uh, believe it or not, hydrogen peroxide, a very special.